Well, I think we have to talk about what infertility is. I mean, it's the inability to achieve a pregnancy technically within a year. Other people define it as within two years. So really, the important thing is not what an insurance company or a government might define it as, or even the World Health Organization, who happens to define it as two years, but what the couple defines it as. And, and it really changes um, as, it, it, for individual couples. You have to individualize the definition. For instance, um, for a young couple who's 20 years old and, 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 and trying to get pregnant, you're not gonna get worried if they don't get pregnant in one month or two months or three months. But after um, six months, you would expect most young couples to have been successful already. So you already start identifying people who might have a problem. But for the young couple who's 20, it's probably not a big, big deal if you don't make the diagnosis for another six months because their potential will still be there. For an older couple over the age of 38 or 40, the fertility changes so quickly that losing that extra six months is a big deal. And so for a couple who's, say, 40 and trying for four months, they might have start wanting to wonder what's going on um, and... Uh, and having some testing done to be sure they're not missing the boat because if they wait for a year or two years, you're going to have a problem. As we think about um, the couple who comes to us um, with an inability to get pregnant in the time that they hoped to conceive, um, our first step is to evaluate them and see if their anxieties are well founded and our second step is to begin to reassure them and look at the different parts that come into, um, might be responsible for their infertility. So it's like any system. Um, in order to make a baby, we need eggs, we need sperm, and we need a way for the sperm and the eggs to come together. And it's fairly easy to begin uh, that evaluation with a few simple tests. I think that we can cover um, 80 to 90 percent of the issues um, in the first few weeks after we first meet the couple by doing some blood tests to detect, test for ovarian uh, function, uh, doing a semen analysis to test that the husband is okay, um, and then ultimately um, testing to see if there is, are problems with the fallopian tubes or not. And uh, I think all those things can be done relatively quickly. The other test they do that's part of the basic uh, workup is called a hysterosalpingogram. The hysterosalpingogram, which we abbreviate HSG because nobody can say hysterosalpingogram, um, is looking at the shape of the inside of the uterus and um, the, uh, whether the tubes are open or not. Many centers um, have required women to come back on the, day, on the second or third day of their cycle for FSH and estradiol, and those are still very important tests. Um, but in recent years, we've increasingly been using a new uh, determination uh, known as anti-malarian hormone, uh, otherwise abbreviated AMH. Now, AMH is an interesting um, uh, test uh, because you don't have to do it on a specific day of the cycle. There may be some slight changes as a woman goes through her cycle, but not enough to really influence uh, greatly. Um, so um, we can draw a blood test on a woman the first day she comes in for her first visit. Um, we'll get the result back within a week or so. Um, and uh, that is highly predictive of her ovarian potential. So we'll already know within a few days after her first visit, where she stands with regard to her ovarian function. There's this class of so-called unexplained infertility, and we have some very strong feelings about that here at CHR. Um, it's true that if you do that basic testing, you can account for 80 to 90% of the causes of delay in conception, 
but there may be other things um, that were normally kind of put in this garbage pail diagnosis of unexplained infertility um, that many um, clinics don't um, look for. Um, there can be women who have subtle changes in the way their ovaries function that may explain their inability to conceive in a timely manner um, that aren't picked up by the routine kind of testing um, that other uh, fertility centers tend to do. Um, in a similar way, there can be uh, problems um, in, uh, with the embryos or with implantation um, secondary to immune uh, factors um, that um, we can pick up by some of the extensive immunologic testing that we do here. So um, I'd say that at the end of the day, uh, whereas um, many centers will have 15 to 20 percent of people they'll consider to have unexplained infertility, um, there are very few people that walk away without a diagnosis uh, at CHR. And, and it's important because if you don't make a diagnosis, you can't approach a specific treatment. And um, we like to tailor our treatments to the individual patients based on what we know about them and, and the, diagnosis, uh, the diagnoses that we see. Uh, there could be somebody who by traditional criteria, the old World Health Organization criteria for semen analysis, had a normal semen analysis. But when you look at it carefully, looking at strict morphology, there may be less than the required number of perfect sperm that would explain a delay in conception. Um, similarly, there may be a woman who has um, FSH that's higher than we would expect for her age, or AMH that's already low. We also have age criteria for AMH that others would identify as being close to the normal range, but we would identify as having no ovarian problem. In each of those cases, we can tailor um, our approach to increase their chances of success. Well, the, it will always be true that the most effective thing we can do is in vitro fertilization. If you think of this as a stepwise um, process, uh, IVF uh, and, and all the related procedures that are IVF will always be the most effective way to help people get pregnant in the shortest period of time. But it doesn't mean it's the only way. So that uh, a young couple with open tubes uh, who has time uh, could go through a few cycles of what might be a less effective, but perhaps less costly, um, uh, perhaps somewhat fewer procedures way uh, of achieving their goal. And, uh, what we've done uh, over time, over the years, is a procedure known as intrauterine insemination. There's really a couple of parts to intrauterine insemination. We originally thought of uh, IUI as a way of addressing a couple with normal ovarian function and low sperm count. And the notion was that if we took that semen specimen, which maybe had, let's say it had 20% of the normal count. And we then concentrated the sperm into a very small volume. Uh, we could put a larger dose of sperm uh, into the uterus. What ovulation induction does um, is making, it's helping the woman to produce more eggs. Now, we used to use ovulation induction just for women who didn't ovulate. And there certainly are still a number of those, and they are helped by uh, taking fertility meds uh, to, to ovulate. But the more common usage today in infertility is to take a woman who normally cycles every month and produces one egg and help her to produce multiple eggs. By producing multiple eggs, we, it's like presenting multiple targets, multiple opportunities for the sperm. And so you increase the likelihood that some sperm and some egg are going to find each other, just because there are more numbers. So if we do the intrauterine insemination that we mentioned before, which increases the dose of sperm into the female system, and ovulation induction which increases the number of eggs, we increase the likelihood that some egg and some sperm will get together and thereby increase the chances of pregnancy. So, IVF, as I started out by saying, will always be the most effective way, but there are other things we can do 
uh, along the way.